Welcome to Passion. For more information about Passion, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. Self-driving cars and, and, you know, the Jetsons. Y'all remember the Jetsons? I would, man, it was going to be like that. 2011. Man, I can still remember. I, I'm not exaggerating. I can still remember in the year that Christmas or New Year's Eve 2000, peering through the blinds of our living room at the stroke of midnight, I had 60 gallons of water stashed in my attic because I knew when we peered through the blinds at the stroke of midnight, all the lights were going to go off and the grid was going to go down and we were going to be cast into utter darkness and chaos. Y'all remember the Y2K bug? I mean, we now we're 11 years removed from that. Y'all are getting old. Yeah, I had to get glasses. There you go. That was my Christmas present. I had to go get myself some reading glasses because I'm getting old. 2011, well, New Year's. Uh, it, it seems that, I don't know why we do this, but at the beginning of the year, New Year, we always make goals and New Year's re- resolutions. All I've seen on Facebook is my New Year's resolution, or people say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Y- y'all know, y'all have heard all that. Well, I don't know why we wait to the beginning. I don't know why we don't think we can turn over a new leaf in June. I, I don't understand. But something about January 1st, we start thinking. So I'm not a huge New Year's resolution guy. I don't write a lot of stuff down. I'm going to do this, this, and this. But I do believe that at the beginning of the year is the most appropriate time, if not probably one of the most appropriate time, to talk about beginnings. And so what I want us to do is I want us to go back. And I want us to go back and look at some lessons that we should know but that we need to reflect upon and deal with and remind ourselves of. So I think the best place for us to go at the beginning of a year could perhaps be to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis, if you will. Genesis chapter 1, if you have your word with you, you can turn there. If not, it will be on the screen. Now, I have this gargantuan passage of Scripture to read to you. I'm I'm talking like, uh, well, it's going to be 45 minutes now before I finish reading our passage. So just lock in. Press in, stay with me. 45 minutes worth of word right here. You go, all right? Here's our text. Are you ready? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1a. In the beginning, God. I I was joking. That's our passage right there. Four simple words. But some of the most profound words that you will ever cast your gaze upon or read are mentioned right there. In the beginning, God. Before creation, God. Before order came to chaos, God. Before rhyme or reason, God. Before sense or sensibility, God. In that one simple four-word statement, what we catch is we catch a glimpse of the right, of the necessary, of the divinely appointed order by which creation came into being. I want to go one step further this morning and tell you that those four words give us a glimpse into the only order that not only created creation, but is also the only manner by which we secure an ordered life. In the beginning, God is the order that actually works in our daily life. I want to begin this year by issuing you a very serious challenge that I am praying will overcome you as you go throughout the rest of the year that will set the pace for the rest of your year, that will cause you to think through the rest of the year, that will cause you to reorder your life. Because here's my my, my challenge to you. What if we got back to the this place in our life where everything began with God? What would happen if we got the order right again? But let me break it down. Before we begin a relationship, God. Uh, Before we end a relationship, God. Before we quit this job to go get another job, God. Before we get the credit card out and lay it on the counter to buy something that we need, God. Before we make any decisions that would impact the rest of our life, we stop and we God, before we 
quit church or before we sleep in rather than going to church, God, what would happen if we established the order that God was first in our life? I wonder if we got the order correct, if, if we would see the end of chaos in our life. See, the reality is this morning is that I want you to make sure that you understand that I did not state that if you put God first in your life that you would never be faced with a trial and that you would never go through tribulations again because just the opposite is true. In fact, we are promised that the moment that we try to surrender our life to God that we will be faced with trials and circumstances and situations and there will be hardships. I'm not telling you that if you put God first, you get a get-out-of-jail-free card and you just coast through life. My concern this morning is not that you are dealing with storms. My dad preached last week, if you were here, that we all go through storms. It's a natural occurrence in life. You are going to have to endure storms. But that is not our heritage. Our heritage is, is that we have a Savior that will come alongside of us and say, Peace be still to our storms. But I wonder if we never hear, hear peace be still because we're still trying to drive the boat. See, my concern this morning is not that you're going through trials. My concern is that some of you under the sound of my voice, I know this for a fact, are beyond just going through trials and are, are beyond just having circumstances. The reality of your life is that you are in absolute and total chaos. And the Bible clearly states that God is not the author of confusion. That's chaos. That there should not be chaos in your life. And so I believe that if we would go back and get the order right in our life, that perhaps we would see the end of chaos in our life. I wonder if, if we would adjust our agendas and we would check our motivations and we would handle our dreams and place all of our pursuits so that they began with God if we wouldn't see sense come back to our life. And peace come back to our life. And fulfillment come back to our life. And purpose come back to our life. If we would just get the order correct. See, I tend to believe that God in the beginning was the prerequisite for creation. But I also think that we miss the truth that that is also the prerequisite and the key ingredient for creation in our own life. See, the truth is this morning is that God ordered an entire universe. So why can't he be trusted to order your life? Oh, y'all, y'all awful quiet already, and it's going to get tight in here because, uh, y'all know, I, I don't normally challenge y'all very much. <clears throat> yeah. You should have known on the first Sunday that I was with you, I was going to drop the bomb on you. Well, here we go. If God can order the complexities of the human body, why can he not give you a plan for your life? If God can structure the planets and make sure that the sun is far away from the earth just enough so that it doesn't burn us, burn us up, and if, if God can put the moon at a certain distance, just at the right certain distance so we don't have tidal waves, and if God can place the stars just in the right location, then why in the world can't he find you the right job? If God can order the night and the day and the light and the dark and make them have perfect balance and put the earth on the perfect axis, then why can't he find you a spouse? Why do you have to take matters into your own hands? I'm preaching right now and you don't like me much, but that's just the way it is. See, the reality is, is that we believe that he can pull off the impossibilities of creation, but we think and we live and we be behave as if, as if he can't handle the impossibilities of our lives. That was good. Amen, Steve. That was good. We actually believe with everything within us, at least I do, that God created the heavens and the earth. I don't have any problem with that. I have no problem stating that in the beginning was God and, and understanding that he created all that we see. My issue is that now I struggle with the concept that he can actually deal with the impossibilities of my life. We sing this song, at least we used to. I grew up in a church where we sang hymns and now we go to funerals and we hear some of these same songs and other churches hear these same songs. And, and, and we sing this song. Y'all know it. I'm, I'm just going to mention the first few words. Y'all going to want to break into song. His eye. See, I knew it. I knew it. You know it. It's on the sparrow. Do you remember the next line? And I know that he watches me. I am convinced that most of us sing that 
and believe it for the person standing next to us and never grasp the reality that when we're singing those words, we're actually talking about me and us and that he does know where we are and he is watching over us and we, if we would just relinquish control of our life to him. So we go on and we sing this. Why should I feel discouraged? I feel like singing. Y'all don't want to, y'all don't want to start the year off like that. Uh, why should I feel discouraged? Why should shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely? And the implied answer is, is that none of that should happen, and yet we still feel lonely, and we still feel discouraged, and we feel still shadowed. And I think if we would come to grips with the understanding that if we got God back to the beginning of our lives, we would not feel that way. The order is wrong. So my challenge is simple in concept, but very difficult in reality. Reorder your life. Listen to this. This is my challenge to you. Reorder your life so that this year your entire life, not just your church life, not just your home life, not just your work life, not just your dating life, don't hold anything back, no areas off limits. I will reorder my entire life so that I put God at the beginning of every area. Now, the only problem with that is that there are challenges to that. (laughs) I want you to do it, but I want you to go into it understanding that this is not going to be easy. I need you to understand that there are challenges. I'm going to mention three of them to you quickly. Number one, there is a battle for first place in your life. I, I just want you to be aware that if you accept my challenge and reorder your entire life to put God first, you just need to know going in that there is going to be a battle. There is a battle for first place in your life. Are y'all here this morning? Okay, I just want to make sure you're listening. At the moment that you decide, I'm going to give God every aspect of my life. I'm not going to make any decisions without contacting him. I'm not going to spend any money without asking him first. I'm not going to start a relationship, end the relationship, make no changes in my life without asking him first. He is going to dictate what I watch, what I listen to, where I go, who I hang out with. At that moment, I promise you, there will be a war. You just need to know and recognize this morning that there is a natural and a supernatural war for your attention and for your allegiance. Bad things will try to become number one in your life, right? There will be bad things that will try to overtake you and get your attention off of God so that they can become your number one attention. And we like to talk about those things. Money, drugs, power, sex, fame. Those things will try to grab you. But what we fail to talk about is the fact that the good things also try to overtake the God things. Oh, y'all quiet this morning. There are good things that are going to come your way this year that are going to look like opportunities. And if you're not careful, good things will overcome God things and they become your God. Anything that's between you and God is, guess what, your God. And if we are not careful, because of this battle, this ongoing war, we will relinquish control too quickly to something that's not God and lose. I want to tell you this morning that you need to understand that what I am calling you to is a full-blown, all-out, blood and guts war. What I am talking to you about, this challenge of reordering and restructuring your life so that God comes first, is not for any weak need, pansy. I feel like the Geico commercial. Y'all seen that one where the guy's counseling? He's a drill sergeant and picks up the, t- the tissue box and throws it at him. That's how I feel. I, we, you will not restructure anything in your life if you're weak need, pansy, wimpy little Christian. This is not for weekend warrior Christians. I am talking to people and challenging you to step up and to man up and to go to war and go to fight and actually do what the Bible says, which is to beat things into subjection into your life and put God back where he belongs and get the order right. And put him at the first place on the throne. That is that kind of war can only be won by people who are tired of chaos. 
who are weary with confusion. That kind of battle can only be won by people who, are, who flatly refuse to accept mediocre, who are willing to press all the way in and lay everything at the throne of God and say, you're first. The second thing I would say to you this morning is this. To put God at the beginning means that other things have to move towards the end. Put another way, let me say it like this, and I want you to catch this carefully. Listen carefully right here. The position or the placement that God holds in your life is revealed by the allocation of our time, our finances, our energy, and our attention. I think I should say that again because that's worthy of listening to again, even if I did write it myself. The position or placement that God holds in your life will be, is revealed by your allocation of time, your allocation of money, your allocation of your energy, and your allocation of your attention. See, the reality, the truth for you this morning is that most of us have become very satisfied and comfortable with God being number two, or in some of our cases, number 26. The only problem with that is that God is not comfortable with that position. In fact, His Word clearly states, I am God, don't have any other gods before me. He is only satisfied with number one. And in order for Him to become number one, other stuff had to take back seat. So my question for you this morning is, what sits on the throne of your life? Check yourself. Maybe it's Facebook. Oh, shoot. Maybe it's caffeine. Maybe it's food. Uh, let me get real practical. Y'all ain't going to like me today, but that's all right. What holds first place? Is it your TV? Is it your car? Is it your house? Is it him? Is it her? Is it your job? Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me break it down real practical, and then you can be mad at me. Because I hear this stuff all the time. Now, now listen, y'all see stuff in my life, that's fine. I see stuff in your life. But I'm just going to tell you what I see in some of y'all. Because y'all said, some of y'all said, I don't have any time for the word. Y'all, you just don't understand. I, I work four jobs. I'm tired. I don't have any time for the word. But you never miss American Idol. If he's going to be first. You got no time to read your, I'm asking for five minutes a day, four minutes a day, five days a week to read your New Testament through in one year. And some of you honestly will say, I don't have time for that. But you will set your DVR and stay up till three o'clock in the morning to watch your show. And you'll check your Facebook 9,600 times. Some of you say, well. God can have first in my life everywhere except my finances. You don't understand, Steve. I am broke. I, I can't pay my tithes. You just don't understand. I, God can handle everything else. He's just, he just not a very good bank person. He just evidently is not good with figures, although there is a book in the Bible called num- Numbers. Okay. Uh, but he's, he's not very good with numbers, apparently. So I'm going to have to. So I just don't. I cannot afford to pay my tithes. And yet, somehow, some way. Oh, y'all ain't going to like this. You go buy a new couch or a new set of clothes or you go out and eat every night with no problems. And when the electric company calls and wants their money, you pay them. How come we don't ever complain? Oh, y'all, oh, I felt that one bound. We, we don't get mad at the electric company guy when he calls and says, you owe me money. We don't go, boy, I ain't never going back to that electric company again. Because we got the order wrong. We go, I've, I've even heard some of you say this, I don't need relationships. I don't need nobody. I, I just don't need nobody. I'm an island. Don't need nobody. Don't need nobody. And yet, you, you won't get involved in a small group. You won't serve. You won't help nobody. You're an island all by yourself. The only problem with that is then when nobody talks to you, you get mad. <laughs> uh, come on. I, I, well, this one, this is my pet peeve. See, I, that's the cool thing about getting the mic. I get to talk about my pet peeves, I guess. But I get this one, too. I get this one more times than I'm willing to admit. I, this is one I hear all the time. I was too sick to come to church. I was too tired. You don't understand, Pastor Steve. I worked all week long, and I'm exhausted, so I couldn't come to church. But tomorrow morning, y'all know where I'm going. Tomorrow morning, you'll be right at your desk infecting everybody around you. 
and, and you, you go there and you make everybody else sick. But you won't come to the one place where we can lay hands on you and say, be whole. What's wrong? Our order's wrong. We've caused God not to be God. We've placed him down. Let me ask you a question this morning. Listen. What is, what indicates for those around you, listen to me, listen to me. If you don't catch anything else, answer this question this morning. What indicates for those around you that God is first in your life? Okay, now listen. Don't take me for a fool. I know that you can fake it. I've, y'all have met them too, right? They, they, they come to church every week. They're, they've got all the attendance. I mean, they, y'all young folks don't know about no attendance pins, but attendance pins down to the floor. They can quote more passages of Scripture than the pastor can. They go nuts during praise and worship, and they unload their pocketbook into the offering plate and make a big show of what they give. And when you really dig down into their life, you recognize that God is not number one in their life. So I understand that it can be faked, and you can pull the wool over people's eyes. I do understand that. But at the same time, I do want to say to you that all we can judge is what we see and what we hear. It's not the best indicator, but it is an indicator. It's one of the only indicators we have. So what in your life, by what people see and by what people hear, can they look to 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 determine that God is number one in your life? Let me get very practical for you. How would your next door neighbors know that God is number one in your life If you roll out of bed at the same time they do on Sunday. How would your co-workers recognize that God is number one in your life if your attitude and the things that you talk about and the way that you talk about your boss is the same exact way that they talk about those people? How would the bank teller know that God is absolutely number one in your life if when she looks at your bank statement, you spend all of your money the same way she spends all of her money? Students, how would your classmates know that God is number one in your life if you go to the same places they go to, yet use the same vulgar language they use, Dress the same way they dress. Listen to what they listen to. Watch what they watch. What is the visible or audible indication that God is number one in your life? We hate the passage of Scripture that says you are to be separate. What needs to go down in our life for God to go up? How do people really know that God is number one? Just that little cross you put on your bumper, get a grip. They just think you bought the car from somebody else that knew something about Jesus and they stuck it on and you inherited it. Because as you're going down the road honking at them and doing what you do, what is the visible indicator that God is first? And finally, I just want to remind you that God does not become number one by accident. For some reason, if there was ever a generation, we'll amen this because we think we're talking about the kids, but we're not. We're talking about our generation. If there was ever a generation, it's this one. We have lost the discipline aspect of discipleship. We want quick fix Christianity. Don't ask me for more than one hour. Don't ask me to read. You read for me. Don't ask me to pray. You pray for me. Don't ask me to fast. Don't ask me to do nothing, but I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to be mature spiritually. Try that one and see if it works. Because it does not work. There is a discipline aspect of discipleship that we must get back. I know of no one that has accidentally stumbled into a discipled walk. Never. I don't know anybody that's accidentally become a radical follower of Christ. I know of no one that actually accidentally read their New Testament through in a year. 
You will not accidentally pray more. You will not accidentally fast more. You will not accidentally attend church more. You will not accidentally witness to your movers more. You will not accidentally invite somebody to church. There is nothing accidental about placing God first in your life. He doesn't get there by accident. You have to place him there. I want to say this to you. Quit waiting on an accident. And make up your mind to make a change and reorder your life. Matthew 6, reveals our discipline, duty, and the blessing of order. We love this passage of Scripture. We like to quote it all the time. We don't live it. We just like to quote it. It's this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here's the part we really like. And all. We like that all stuff. And all these things will be added to you. So we love this passage of Scripture because it speaks to the all stuff. We just don't want to deal with the actual part that's about seeking. We quote it trying to convince ourselves that our weak, feeble attempts at seeking Him is enough. Because we think seek means accidentally. I'll just be looking for Him and I'll stumble on Him. He'll show up and I wasn't expecting Him and I didn't make preparations for Him and I wasn't pursuing Him and then boom, there's God. No, it doesn't work that way. God only inhabits prepared places. Y'all are quiet this morning. See, I think we fail to grab the meaning and the implications of the word seek. We don't understand what that word means because in the original language, what that word means, the word seek means to strive after or to require or to demand. That's what it means. Let me state it like this for you, my favorite quote of all times. One of the two favorites. The proof of desire is pursuit. If God is going to be first in your life through the course of this year, it will be and only be that way because you pursued Him to make Him that. It has to be an intentional act. It will be that God is first in our life because we make the right choices. We force ourselves to make the right choices. We force ourselves, even when it's not convenient, and even when it's not comfortable, and even when it's not popular, to make the right decisions, the right choices, the right time allocations, the right changes. So my question to you is, what are you intentionally, purposely going to pursue from the Lord this year? Now, I do want to tell you this. Good intentions are worthless. Good intentions pile up at our feet. How many of you made a New Year's resolution? Come on. Nobody? Okay, one. Josh, me. Oh, two. Okay, the three of us. Okay, mine was not to drink uh, Coca-Cola because I was drinking too many of it. Only problem is January 3rd, I went to a ball game. And they had Coca-Cola, and by some divine turn, I had a dollar. Okay, that's intentions. I had good intention. Good intentions are useless. Here's our problem. We judge others by their behavior. We want to be judged by our intentions. I want to judge you by how you act, but I don't want you to judge me by how I act or the choices I make. Intentions are worthless. There has to be some gumption, some guts, some backbone, some determination, some some, I'm not going to give up, I'm going to press through. You've got to get to that place in your walk with God. Because intentions speak to an I hope to mentality. I'm challenging you to begin to discipline yourself and purposely reorder your life. Will it be easy? If it was easy, everybody would do it. But I want to tell you this morning, the benefits are worth it. Can I just tell you about three or four benefits real quick? How about these? Steel for strife. I like that benefit. Calm for chaos. I'll take that benefit any day. Blessing for busted. I kind of like blessing. Destiny for distraction. Those are the results. You don't accidentally get those things. We look at people and go, they're so blessed. 
What are they doing I'm not doing? You wouldn't want to know. Because you wouldn't want to do it. It takes discipline. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 20, and then I'm done. It screams to us about this reality. Listen carefully. The Son is the is in the image. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. He's in the beginning. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. Listen to this passage right here. And in him all things hold together. In other words, Jesus is the glue that holds your life together. But unless we understand his position, which is according to the word of God, he is first, he is first in order, he is first in importance, he is the center of everything. Until we recognize that fact and realign ourselves with that fact and reposition him in our life as the center of everything, we got no glue, baby. And we will fall apart. Some of you have fallen apart last year because you did not maintain Jesus at the center of your being and He wasn't first and He wasn't foremost and He wasn't prominent and your whole life was in shambles because you had no glue. And so this year what I want to challenge you is this. I'm not asking you to place Jesus first and everything else second, third, fourth, and fifth. That's... A messed up mentality. Listen to this. There's a shift here, a subtle shift that I want you to catch. Because he is first and he is the center of everything, we've got to realign properly. Listen to me. What I'm asking you is this. It's not Jesus, then my family. It's Jesus in my family. It's not Jesus, then my career. I have so realigned myself that whether I'm flipping hamburgers or I'm working a $900,000 a year job, it's not Jesus and then my career. It's Jesus in my career. It's not Jesus then my church. It's Jesus in my church. You cannot separate the fact that Jesus is at the very essence, the very center of everything. And until you place him back in that rightful row and order your life so that everything revolves around him, every decision, every choice, every desire, every thought, every word, and when you can finally wrap yourself back into that realigned life, something unique will happen for you. Glue. Life will make sense. Your life will work. Chaos will cease and desist. But it only comes from a disciplined decision. So my challenge to you this year is this. Examine your life. Begin from the beginning. Place Christ in his rightful place. Let me ask you a question and then I'll shut up and we'll pray. What would your life look like on January the 1st, 2012? If on January the 9th, 2011, everything changed and revolved around him. Can I tell you one thing I know about it? It would look better. Now, churches like to say it would look busier because they expect you to come to everything. No, I didn't say that. We like to put legalistic ideas on that that will make you look more holy. No, I didn't say that. I said it would make your life better if you would just put him first. Stand with me this morning. There are 356 days left. What's that? 350 shopping days till Christmas. I think. 
But I do know there are 356 days left in this year. You will not arrive at day 356 with blessings and abundance unless on day 9 a decision was made. Because you don't accidentally put God first. You don't accidentally get rid of bad attitudes. You don't accidentally grow up. I challenge you this year. Reorder your life. What needs to take second place? What needs to drop down in importance so that God can come up? Father, I pray over this body. I pray first corporately, Father, that we would put you first. That everything that we are, everything that we do, everything that we long for, all of our desires and dreams and plans and ambitions would be centered around your son, Jesus. Father, we refuse to try to build a name for us. We refuse to try to build a kingdom for us. Instead, we elevate you to your rightful place. You are God. You're first and foremost and if people are going to be drawn, it's going to be because they're drawn to you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name as a body, you would help all of us to work together to keep the focus on you in all that we say and all that we do and everywhere that we go. Let your kingdom expand because of what we do. Let souls, hundreds and hundreds of souls come into the family take on your name, not our name, for your glory and honor. But Father, I also pray individually this morning for each person standing under the sound of my voice, whether they're here in the building or watching over the internet. Help us to search our hearts. Help us to take stock this morning. Help us to evaluate the own condition of our lives. Father, I know this to be a fact that some of us have grown extremely comfortable with you at a lesser position than the one who sits on the throne. So, Father, I'm praying that what you would help us to do today is kill some other gods, remove some other gods, idols, things that have gotten between us and you. We, we make a conscious decision today to reorder our lives, to place you first, to place you at the center of everything that we are. I pray that glue would begin to flow through this body. I pray that lives that last year I watched fall apart, I pray that now we would begin to see them being held together because of the placement of Jesus at the center of our finances, the center of our time, the center of our attention, the center of our energy, the center of our attitudes, the center of our thought life. Our entire world would spin in perfect harmony around your son, Jesus. And Father, I pray for visible indicators to begin. I pray that those around us, the folks that we run into at the store, the folks that wait on us, the folks that we rub shoulders with at work, I pray all the fake stuff would stop because we give you a bad name when we try to fake it. But I pray that genuine indicators would begin to arise in our lives and people would look at us and say, man, there is something different about them. I want what they have. I pray that the way we talk, the way we walk, the way we behave, the way we work, would all point to the fact that you're first in our life and others would want what we have. In Jesus' name, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around except my prayer team. If you're here this morning and you say, Steve, I, I, I've never placed Jesus at the center of my life. Or maybe I have a long time ago and I've walked away from him and my life is falling apart. I got news for you this morning. Your life will never be in the right order and you will never find that calm in the chaos. 
without first asking Jesus to be your life. The great news this morning is that it's not difficult. It's very easy. All we do is we ask Him. We believe Him when He says we're saved. And we confess with our mouth. We tell others. And the Word declares at that moment there's an exchange that happens. There's a realignment, a repositioning. And Jesus takes the throne of our life and everything changes. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, we don't want to make it difficult for you. For you, In fact, all we really want to do is pray intelligently for you. We will not embarrass you. If that's you, would you just simply raise your hand and pull it right back down? I promise you we won't embarrass you. We just want to pray. Is there one? Is there one? Father, I take by that that every person in this room knows you. Help us to be disciples this year. Help us to discipline our lives to reflect and to share and to exhibit your glory. And Father, we'll praise you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Would you do this? Would you turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to reorder. And then you're free to go. Thank you for being here this morning. We love you. We'll see you at prayer Wednesday night, 730. Love to have you here. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more passion resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion. 